The Wild Hunt is a story told across Europe in many forms and versions, and it was Jacob Grimm, a folklorist, and whose fairy tales you may have heard of, who originally grouped these types of stories into the phenomenon we call today the Wild Hunt. And it was he who thought that Odin, the old Norse god, was its leader, and that Odin was reduced to but a ghostly figure by Christianity who influenced these stories. However, in modern times, some scholars have become critical of Grimm's analysis, and perhaps one of the better known of these scholars is Le Cateau, who infers that the stories didn't evolve as Grimm suggests, and that, for example, uh, the Odin figure as its leader is a post-Christian conversion evolution of the story, and Odin was not its original leader. And so, who is right? Where did the world hunt come from? What did it mean? And who was its leader? So, welcome to the story of the Wild Hunt, and welcome to Crackenford. Imagine being in a forest at night time, at midwinter. It's so very dark, very cold, and the wind is gusting past your face. There's a rumble of thunder, and you think you hear the sounds of what could be screaming. Or animals running and squealing, neighing and screeching. Branches crack and creak and break. The noise and the wind surrounding you, but you can't tell where it's coming from. It seems to be above you, but passes as quickly as it came. And if you're unlucky, in the wrong place, at the wrong time, perhaps you were standing in their way, in the middle of a path or open field. Then, then you may see a dark figure come towards you. And the outcome of such meetings are really comforting. And so, due to a number of questions I always get, before I start properly, I want to say that there was a lot of research carried out to make this video, and I've referenced all the books and papers I've cited in the making of this in the description below. I've also added chapters to this video if you want to skip to certain parts, such as the storytelling sections, although I do know some of you like them and there are also English subtitles so to help you follow along if you need help with my accent, pronunciations or spellings. And there is of course a like button down below if you want to press that to help others see the video and help promote this and I would really appreciate it if you did that. So thank you and let's begin. And it's probably best to say at the start that there is no definite answers here. We will look at evidence and make educated inferences, and I'll give my own view based on these, but there is no definite proof we can say about the Wild Hunt's source. But the first piece of evidence we should look at is the literary sources, and the oldest written version of a Wild Hunt story we know and can date with accuracy is Alderic's Vitalis's written in 1092, and he recorded a story which he called the Infernal Hunt, after talking to a priest who said he encountered the hunt one night. And that priest's story goes like this, that whilst he was walking home after visiting a sick man, he heard a frightening noise around him, and so he went to hide by the side of the road, behind some medlar trees. But he found his way was blocked by a giant warrior waving a club. He looked around for a way to go, and as he turned, he saw in the sky a swarm of shapes flying by, weeping and moaning over their sins. They were corpse bearers with coffins over their shoulders, and he counted over 50 bodies in all. And these were followed by women on horseback, and they had golden nails in them. And they were then followed by many powerful figures from the church on horseback and the priests recognised many of these people as they had all died recently. And when he turned to look back for the giant warrior, he too was now flying through the air, joining the procession. This version of a hunt is one that is obviously influenced by the Christian writer, with the talk of sinners and women atoning for their sins, uh, which is the reason why they have nails in them. Uh, and we are aware of other stories where people were said to have had to lie on the ground and make Christian symbology, often with their bodies, such as the sign of a cross, to protect themselves. But also within this, we see different types of dead being mixed together, 
giants and coffin bearers, and this too is reflective of the story evolving from a heathen to a Christian themed story. And perhaps most interesting of all is this supernatural being who leads the hunt, a giant warrior. And although a lack of detailed description would normally mean we can identify the, the leader, the warrior, so we don't know whether he was a king or a god, um, there are some who would argue that in many stories the descriptions of the Old Norse god, Odin, make him consciously unidentifiable, and it is that inability to identify him via the story that could paradoxically then identify him as an Odin figure. But there is no way to be sure, um, but it may be the reason, or the reasoning behind, making some people believe Odin was the leader of the hunt, alongside his role which is associated with the dead. But things just aren't that simple to work out, and the wild hunt is incredibly complex. You see, within this single version of the story, we see the dilemma facing us and other academics, and anyone wishing to understand what the wild hunt means and its origins. Even Jacob Grimm accepted this, yeah, as do many scholars, and that is that the wild hunt stories have evolved over time, over hundreds if not thousands of years, creating many variant forms, leaving us with a problem of how to understand its original form and meaning. And with so much to consider, our scholars are often in disagreement with each other over these origins. And where there are hypotheses of the wild hunt's origins, a number of the modern day ones include critical assessments of Jacob Grimm's work. Now, Grimm's view of the wild hunt was that it was a nocturnal ride of dead heroes led by a pagan god and his female consort. And whilst it is accepted that Grimm, at the time of writing about the Wild Hunt, was probably the most knowledgeable source on the hunt, we should also consider that Grimm's books on Teutonic mythology, or what the layman would understand today as Germanic mythology, were published well over 150 years ago. And whilst at the time they were considered pioneering and influenced many scholars, certainly over the next hundred years, modern research and findings have provided significant challenges to his findings. But these too aren't without critical analysis. You know, three noted modern scholars have had the following to say about the hunt. First, there's Eva Pox, who said that by looking at the wild hunt, it shows that outlines of a common Indo-European inheritance seem to emerge. This is connected to the cult of the dead, the dead bringing fertility to sorcery and shamanism in relation to different gods of the dead, who are linked to shamanism that are ensured fertility by way of the dead, and Carlo Ginsberg called it a night ride of prematurely dead humans led by a fertility goddess, and Le Couteau, whose recent books are well read and often quoted on the subject, and whose work is considered a viable working hypothesis of explanation by Hutton, uh, he said the wild hunt is a band of the dead, and that it fell into the vast complex of ancestor worship, the cult of the dead, who are the go-betweens between men and things. Le Couteau also called the huntsman the avatar of the ancient, or the avatar of an ancient uh, ambivalent deity who presided over death and resurrection, a, a psychopomp, you know, a guider of souls. And so, the only thing that becomes clear if you put all this on a page is that there isn't a clear answer. In fact, I would argue that there are some things you just wouldn't normally see even on the same page. And so we have a number of different scholarly views on the hunt, the origins of the hunt, its purpose, its leaders. And so who could be right? Or could they all be right or wrong? So let's start considering what made up the possession of the hunt, you know, what beings it contained. So here the wild hunt stories are reasonably consistent at a high level, in that they show a collection of beings, either the dead or their spirits, or supernatural beings, and occasionally animals, often accompanied by furious wind and in a nocturnal procession, uh, and led by a huntsman at the front of the hunt, although not always, and it is the leader is sometimes an animal, and sometimes they are mutilated. And it is often only the leader that people who encounter the hunt can interact with. Now, from this chart of how a hunt could be made up, then we can say that almost all descriptions of the wild hunt can be separated into its two parts. The hunt, with its possession or collection of beings, 
and the leader, the huntsman or another key figure. So with at least this agree, this division, how can we start to understand these stories? Like most stories that were being told during the Christian conversion of much of Europe, we have to thank the Christian scholars for writing them down. However, as they were heathen elements to these stories, as they were pre-Christian, uh, by this definition of when this was happening, then there was often an element of Christian bias written into these stories to suppress anything that wasn't considered appropriate. And it was then these versions, when written down, became more widely told versions of the wild hunt as they could more easily be retold at gatherings like church sermons or feasts or festivals. And so, to add to all the disagreement and complexity of the wild hunt stories, we now can add this as to why stories have changed. And this is how heathen history has been changed by being written in a Christian Europe. But we do have some luck. And that is that the non-Christian elements of the stories were not written out completely. There are characters of the supernatural and pre-Christian mythology that were kept in. And it's these remnants of the older myths that allow us to have a belief that these stories were being told long before Christianity came to Northern Europe. And so before 500 CE. But this helps little in finding out the origin of the hunt. And so let's look at different leaders of the wild hunt and see if there are any obvious patterns there. And we can do this by looking at a map of Europe showing where the stories of the wild hunt were told and who led the hunt in those stories. In Britain we have Hectate and Hurlething or King Hurler's Hunt, King Arthur, Hearn the Hunter, Old Nick and Woden. And there are regional variations. We have Cain's Hunt and the Devil's Dandy Dogs and Gabriel's Hounds. In Scandinavia there are stories of Oscaria, Asgarthia, Lucy, King Vold, Sigurdsservin, and Odin's Yacht. Down in front you have Artus and Harlequin or Helquin, and next to it in Switzerland you have Durston Yeg. Further south in Spain we have Count Arnu, and in Germany, where it seems that most versions of the hunt can be found, there is the Wild Jagd, Wildes Yet, Wotan's Army, Nachshar, Tottensrug, Wotendes Herr, Totten's Procession, Wodan, Holder, and many others. And even in America, the story of the ghost riders is considered a derivative of this story. But looking at this map, there's no obvious patterns in the names. But there is one link, one connection you could infer, albeit unconvincing at this point, and that is that these stories could be associated with the first proto-Indo-Europeans that migrated into Central and Western Europe from the Russian steppes. And this is because of the locales of the stories told here within Europe, and how you can associate them with the language split of the proto-Indo-Europeans. In effect, the first wave of the proto-Indo-European ancestors spoke a language derivative of proto-Indo-European called Centum Division. And we talked about that split a little more when we looked at the stories of the famine and of the dead uh, in this video. Uh, and from this, we know that they had a different cosmic belief than later Proto-Indo-European migrations, especially around death. And to show what I mean, I'll enhance the map with an orange highlight where the Centum Division settled in Europe. For those who were wondering, the Proto-Indo-Europeans who remained around the steppes spoke what became part of the Satum Division. And I'll do a video specifically on this split at some point in the future, as I believe it to be an incredibly important moment in cultural and religious evolution especially for European religious belief. And seeing that this split uh, overlaps with this isn't necessarily strong enough evidence in itself. I mean, it doesn't prove anything beyond doubt. But we shouldn't forget the possibility for now. And so from this, we have some data that may be useful and may help us understand why stories specifically changed. Therefore, perhaps to look at another wild hunt story uh, may help us. And the one I'll look at next is probably one of the most famous stories. And this is the story of King Hurler's Hunt, sometimes called Hurlething. And this is was written at the end of the 12th century by Walter Mapp, and it goes like this. One day, a dwarven king visited the court of King Hurler, requesting an audience. The dwarf was gaily attired in spotted fawn skin, and he had a long red beard reaching to his chest. His belly was hairy, and his legs ended in goat's hooves. 
the strange king rode up to Hurla, mounted on a large goat, and happily announced that Hurla's forthcoming wedding to a Frankish princess should be brilliantly adorned by my presence as a guest. He then decreed that oh, I shall first attend your wedding and you mine on the same day a year hence. Without waiting for a response, he turned swifter than a tiger and vanished from view. This was a surprise to Hurla, especially given that he was not currently engaged to be married to anyone. Yet soon after the dwarf had departed, Frankish ambassadors arrived to propose such a marriage, and Hurla quickly accepted. During the following wedding feast, the dwarven court provided a vast array of food and served all the guests with such efficiency that Hurla's own servants were left sat with their hands before them, neither called for nor offering aid. The dwarves' splendid clothing and jewels made them shine like burning lights among the company. Never importunate, never out the way, they vexed no one by act or word. Now one year later, the dwarven king suddenly appeared before Hurla and called on him to fulfil his agreement by attending the dwarf's own wedding. Hurla quickly gathered the provisions for a feast with several followers, was led by the dwarf into a vast, deep cave in a high cliff. After an interval of darkness, they passed into a light which seemed to proceed not from the sun or moon, but from a multitude of lamps, and so entered the mansion of the dwarves. And after the wedding, the dwarven king bestowed on her a vast array of gifts, but especially numerous were those of horses, dogs, hawks, and every appliance of the best for hunting or fowling. One of these gifts was a bloodhound, and the dwarf warned Hurler that none of his company should dismount from their horses until that dog leapt from the arms of its bearer. Thanking him, Hurler's court began their ride home. On exiting the dwarf's cave in the bright sun, Hurler spied an old shepherd tending his flock, and he rode up to him. Hurler asked if the old man had heard any news of the queen. The shepherd gazed at him with astonishment and said, Sir? I can hardly understand your speech, for you are a Briton and I a Saxon. But the name of that queen I have never heard save that, say, oh, a long time ago there was a queen of that name over the very ancient Britons who was the wife of King Hurla. And he, the old story says, disappeared in a company with a pygmy at this very cliff and was never seen on earth again, and is now two hundred years since the Saxons took possession of this kingdom. Hurla sat stunned by this news. A few of his men began to dismount in shock, forgetting the dwarves' warning concerning the bloodhound, and as soon as their feet touched the ground, the men instantly turned to dust. Hurla quickly ordered the rest of his men to stay mounted until the dog obliged them by leaping down. But the dog never did leap down. The ages passed and Hurla's company were condemned to a long, lonely march through time. Walter Mapp claims that they were last seen in the marches of Wales and Hereford in the first year of the reign of King Henry II, when Mapp was a boy of 15. At that time, Hurla's company was said to have been accosted by a large group of armed Welshmen, forcing the company to plunge into the River Wye, turn into the air and vanish forever. Here we have a very magical story, you know, fantasy laden version with themes that are a combination of eternal punishment and perpetual wandering, themes that are common in some of the other versions of the Wild Hunt. And the other interesting fact about this tale is what some scholars believe to have happened to King Hurler's name, and that is that they believe it may have well evolved into the Harley Quinn name in the French versions of the Wild Hunt. But before we dig deeper, there is one more version of the Wild Hunt story I want to tell taken from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles, which is a book noting the history of the Anglo-Saxons in England. And on the entry dated 1127, it states, For it was common gossip up and down the countryside that after February the 6th, many people both saw and heard a whole pack of huntsmen in full cry. They straddled black horses and black bucks, whilst their hounds were pitch black with staring hideous eyes. This was seen in the deer park of Peterborough town, and in all the woods stretched from there to as far as Stamford. All through the night monks heard them sounding and winding their horns. Reliable witnesses who kept watch in the night declared that there might well have been twenty or even thirty of them riding and galloping wildly. These three stories I've told so far, in themselves, 
only help us so far as to show that there is no obvious common source other than to say stories being told a thousand years ago were already quite different whether with or without Christian influence. It is these that allow us to feel that the wild hunt story is older than Christianity or at least was around much of Europe before Christianity and I'm not sure any reasonable scholar would ever doubt that. Now with this mix of stories and combinations of beings and animals that make up the procession within the hunt, can we look at these and ask ourselves are there any clues um, we can see about the beings that made up the hunt's possession. And we can have two views on this. And the first view is from those that support Grimm's work. These hunt types were as follows. There were humans, sometimes the recently deceased, and often the damned or sinners, or those who left in purgatory. Uh, they were often seen wearing the clothes they died in or holding possessions that were close to them. There are sometimes armies, phantom armies, furious armies. They had fought and died in battles. And if we take Schmidt's opinion of the Wild Hunt, where there are armies led by a king, such as King Arthur's Wild Hunt, these armies actually aren't possessions of the dead, all chaotic and rampant, but an army in the aristocratic point of view, with no cosmic significance. And sometimes the procession represented the dead who had escaped purgatory to come to warn the living. Also within the procession there are often mythical beings such as elves and dwarves, but also fairies or pixies, witches, giants, ogres and demons. And finally there were animals, with horses and dogs often being the most common types. But we also have stories of birds, cattle, pigs and snakes. And the participants of the procession, whether human or animal or otherwise, may have sometimes been mutilated or have had extra body parts such as additional arms or legs or even heads. And so, looking at these participants, there is such a variation, such different themes, that to find a hint of an original all-encompassing element is just difficult to pin down. But the difference between humans and animals in the hunt is that animals are generally ageless. I mean, their appearance doesn't require a human's knowledge of a recent war or death, meaning that animals may be a more consistent theme than looking for individuals, and so therefore could allow a belief that an animal may be the oldest leader of a hunt, or at least a being or beings that did not require personification. To understand who they were. But then there is the other view of hunt types, a more modern view, pushing against Grimm's thoughts, and that is that the hunt is split in two types of procession. The first being one of female spirits that visited humans uh, and their homes to bless them, to feast, and living people could join the hunt, and these hunts tended to be led by a supernatural female, a Diana or Herodias, uh, and it is this type that pushes against the Odin figure as its leader, as you can't really say this plot is aligned to Odin's mission operandi, you know, his purpose. And the, uh, the other type of hunt was predominantly made up of dead human beings uh, and was really regarded as being a sign of bringing good to the world. And whilst some scholars have tried to link these two types together when investigating the wild hunt, they really should be treated as two separate types in analysis, and even though we can't rule out for sure that they're not both reflexes from the same myth, you know, long, long before any of the myths that have survived up until today. So, as I say, we can't link these two types of possessions, a fertility one and the army of the dead, as they seem quite different. And one can argue that both have strong prehistoric motifs, you know, death and fertility. These are the drivers for life. We cannot say for sure what would come first, but we can certainly have the evidence that for at least one of these being very old indeed. And to me, the wild hunt is about the possession of the dead with a supernatural or righteous leader. You know, this is the wild hunt proper. And uh, I come to this conclusion because of its age. And I'll show you how we can understand that in a minute or two. And so with this version of the Wild Hunt, the one with uh, kings leading the hunt, fantastical beings such as giants or the devil, or more common leaders like Hearn or Harlequin and King Arthur and Odin, uh, this version, which has had variations written down over the last 
thousand years at least, you know, this version of the hunt tended to take a shape of having a ghostly leader and howling black hounds and flew through the sky at night, often as a warning of an oncoming event or tragedy such as war or death. And with these hunts, the leader of the hunt was placed in one of three categories as defined by medieval and early modern scholars. You know, they were either a demon who chases sinners, a sinful man who has been condemned to roam without rest, and a wild man who chases otherworldly prey. Now, the demon and sinner huntsmen both seem to leverage Christian values within their stories, suggesting on the surface at least that the wild huntsman is the earlier form of leader who evolved, and this leader was initially probably without any personification and possibly an animal or, or a being. But where are these pre-Christian versions of the story? Well, here we have to look at leaders of the hunt who were supernatural to see if there are any commonalities to give us hints on this. And two good examples we have are in Fasolt the Giant, who has myths about him building Valhalla for Odin or Valhall for Odin, however you prefer to have your pronunciations, and Orksi the Ogre, who would hunt down a sacrificial virgin in a forest. And what is curious about these stories with supernatural leaders is that it isn't uncommon for these leaders of the hunt to not be riding a horse, a motif that is seen as common in hunt myths today. And so it could be inferred that this is a more modern feature that evolved with time. These supernatural versions of the wild hunt tales are more unique and more infused with folk myth. And the first story I read with the giant who held the club, who stopped the priest from hiding in the woods, could well be considered a reflex of this story type, especially because there's no sin that's taken place, so there is no Christian morality being applied to the leader, to the plot. In fact, if you consider this and consider how widespread and varied the myth is, it would be reasonable to assume that with these supernatural and mythological elements, that it was being told long before Christianity came to Europe, and therefore this may have implications on who or what could have been the original leader of the hunt. And I think we're now in a position to know who this original person, leader, being or animal was. You know, a being is a, a psychopomp, someone who must travel, someone who has a personality that matches a man who is mad in both ways, as in angry and crazy. And we do know this person. This is someone who is often perceived today as being the leader of the hunt, and that is Odin. The same Odin that modern scholars say wasn't the leader of the hunt by trying to link his name to the written stories of the hunt. And this is one of the arguments against Grimm's views. As whilst Odin fits this figure, he isn't attested to in any of the early versions of the story. Now, for those who think Odin was the leader of the wild hunt, this problem yeah, has manifested itself. The first known citation of Odin as a leader of the hunt was printed towards the end of the 16th century, I believe, uh, over 500 years after Christian conversion had formerly happened in Scandinavia. And so from this point of, in time, stories of the wild hunt are often being told as also being led by a devil figure. And this figure is one which some Christian scholars noted as Odin. In effect, as time has passed, Odin has seemed to become an epithet for the devil as more people became Christian, or as Grimm said, one which Christianity has turned into a ghostly figure. And this is why it adds reasoning behind many modern scholars saying that there is no proof Odin is the original leader of the hunt. Here's a later addition to the stories, even though the attributes of his character seems to be a good match, and that many of these stories come from the Germanic region of Europe. It is just that these German stories have no old occurrences of this god. And so we could easily give up at this point and say we really are no closer to finding out about the source of the hunt, apart from saying it is a possession of the dead. So perhaps to find the leader, we should change tact and not consider post-Christian conversion texts as being the best source for understanding the wild hunt. And this means we should look at other historical texts that may help us. And this takes us to Tacitus and his book Germania, written towards the end of the first century. And in this book, Tacitus describes the warriors of a German tribe as painting themselves black 
in the hope their enemy would mistake them for an army of the dead, an Umbra Furlis. And it doesn't take much thought to understand how this could be interpreted as inferring that there was a belief of the Germanic tribes that armies of the dead wandered the earth, and so bring in that part of the wild hunt to life. But that inference isn't as sure, you know, there is no further evidence to support this view, but we could infer that for this to be noted, it must have had some cultural significance, much like Tacitus's notes about the earth goddess Nerthus, and uh, for those who are aware of that. So, I mean, we can supplement this as well um, from a report from the Byzantine historian uh, Procopius. He wrote that he had heard of a myth uh, when the peoples of northwest Gaul, so France, uh, shipped invisible armies of the dead across the seas towards Britain on certain nights of the year. And so we see hints of stories that could have evolved from or evolved into the wild hunt stories. So why haven't some of the academics picked up on this to try and find out the source of the hunt? To me, it feels like Le Coteau and Schmidt and others were looking for wild hunts with figures that could be seen by people, visualised or at least mythologised as being seen by people. So there would be a tangible evidence for them, you know, written stories about them as their key source of evidence, you know, personifications. And it is here, I think, that some scholars may show a lack of awareness of our Indo-European ancestors, their language, their culture, and perhaps maybe a lack of appreciation in the strength of etymology as a tool. But before I go into this, let me mention one more version of the story, an Old Norse version. And for those who follow this channel, we know that the Old Norse had stories that directly linked Indo-Europeans. And here we have one version of their wild hunt story, known as Oskaria or Asgarth Syria, which really means Ride of the Asgarth. In these versions of the story, the hunt was led by Gurudis, or the troll Gudrun Horstail, who we can infer has evolved from the better known Gudrun Gjökadottir. She was the wife of Sigarth, the dragon slayer of Old Norse mythology, who himself was a very popular character in Old Norse myth. And within some versions of this story, Sigarth actually appears but as an old man. However, Gudrun wasn't particularly nice to Sigurd, and so she has had a sullied reputation, to say the least. And this would align with people who deserve to be punished, to be cursed, to forever ride through the night leading the wild hunt. And with this story, we can also infer that this is an older version of the story, almost certainly being first millennium in creation, as it is have leaders of the hunt taken from famous characters of Old Norse poems, and then it would be sensible to infer that they were added because they were popular characters in myth at the time, and that would help this version of the story become more popular, you know, more people to listen to it. So here we see pre-Christian versions of the stories containing the evolution and development that Christian versions of the story eventually had, establishing further that there was an evolution and sometimes a significant evolution of stories that would have happened long before Christianity started writing down. And so we also can't say that Sigurd and Gudrun were more popular than Odin, so why isn't he leading Hunt? I mean, looking at this, we have found some reasonable evidence to hint at an early origin for the Hunt, one that would need a godlike leader, but none of it can really stand up on its own, or to say that Odin was the leader. So now it's worth looking at what we know about the evolution of the Germanic and Old Norse Scots, and what we can tell from traces left in the language used in the hunt stories. So let's go back in time, back to our Proto-Indo-European ancestors around 8,000 years ago, around the time when the Centrum Division split happened from the Russian steppes, and what we know of this is that the European people, a Proto-Indo-European speaking culture started to migrate from the steppes eastwards uh, and on their way across Europe. Back then, our ancestors' primitive gods were anthropomorphic. They lived as ideas in your head, they weren't personified, and you worshipped them out of fear. You sacrificed to them out of fear, as the gods brought bad weather, failed crops, and they brought death. 
And this understanding is well written by Unworth and De Vries. And so what we're trying to say here is that there was no named God, a name that could change over thousands of years in those stories. And so what were these gods called, do we know? Now, before I answer that, I'll put the question out there of, can we say the oldest character we can apply as a leader of the wild hunt uh, as Odin? Well, even considering this revelation, then we still have no proof that he was. In fact, the actual personification of Odin with the wide-brimmed hat and cloak on one eye, that version of Odin certainly hasn't been around for more than 2,000 years. And I'll talk about that in another video soon. But I will touch on the subject now by saying that what is interesting to us is one of the origins of his name. And I say one of the origins as it is believed he is the sum of multiple influences in the build up to hit the personification we know. The Odin we know today is in effect a complex combination of myths, including that of the wild hunt. And I'll, just say, I'll talk more in detail about that as this will complicate a very complex subject even further. So I'll just mention this one origin, and that is inferred uh, by a god called Othor. And Othor means mad, as in angry, wild and crazy, and is often considered a title that arrived from being as a leader of the wild hunt. And it is accepted by most Old Norse scholars that Othor then merged into Othin. And it is more complicated than that, I know, and we'll deal with that in another video, I, I promise. But what we see here is a name of a god cognate with Othin, whose name means mad, and so could be associated with the wild hunt based on the evidence we have. Now, at the same time as Othor was being worshipped in Scandinavia, and this was long before there was any personification of Odin, there was a god in Germania who was considered the same as Odin, and that was Woden, or, or Woden. And, well, on one of many other names you could have called him, depending on your dialect. Now, uh, Woden also influenced the creation of Odin, and this is by, in part, the dropping of the W at the start of the words by Scandinavia, where they proceed the vowel. So Woden becomes Odin, and therefore turns into Odin. But why are we worried about that? Well, this is where Woden fits into the origin of this story. You know, the god Woden was first attested to by Tacitus at the end of the first century, and he was being compared to Mercury, the messenger or traveller. He's a god who was also a psychopomp. And again, we could link this to the leader of the wild hunt, but just that on its own is, again, isn't strong enough evidence. And so this doesn't mean that the wild hunt was a story back in time of Tacitus, even if Woden was an existing figure. And so for those who want literary references, then we should consider the work of Axel Olrix, Odin the Hunter, or Dudvalet's contributions to the study of Odin, especially in his relation to agriculture practices in modern popular law. And although Anatoly Lieberman says in his book Prayer and Laughter, and Lieberman is a scholar with a skill in languages and memory that makes his work truly inspiring, uh, he says, perhaps the most important works in the understanding of Odin and the Wild Hunt are those that are least quoted. They are that of Entertors, the legend of the Wild Hunt and game hunting and Flastique's Harlequin about uh, Germanic myth during the time of the Romans. And so what do these scholars tell us that modern day scholars don't? Well, what is reiterated is that the North gods were spirits, non-personified and probably like this as late as when Tacitus was writing. Woden was probably called Wothen as in the first century CE. He's in the European form of his name. And this name is cognate with Wod or Wode, and so cognate with Woden, and therefore etymologically linked to Wothen as. And so here there is evidence that the leader of the wild hunt, Wode, which is a recognised name as a leader, has been linked to Woden. But again, that, again, isn't the strongest piece of evidence by far. You know, Wothen, as the Indo-European form of Woden, is cognate to Wothu, and that is a Proto-Indo-European word, and it is the word uh, reconstructed from that language that means a collection of spirits, a collection of wild hunters. Not just human spirits, but birds, uh, dogs, horses, 
and it would not be unreasonable then to believe that the hunt almost certainly had a horse as its leader at some point, perhaps a man-eating horse which would eventually turn into a half-man half-horse, which would eventually turn into a man riding a horse, before turning into just a man. And these evolutions are written about, and some say this gives a tantalising glimpse perhaps into the possibility of the mythological birth of Slepnir, Odin's eight-legged horse. But again, that's diverting a bit from where we're going here. Lieberman then goes on to show that the name of Wothra existed long before the formation of Indo-European pantheons, and it wasn't suggestive of a human form. The Wothra was no individual. It was a group of spirits, a host of wild hunters, frightening, frenzied, and of different forms. And it is from these that the personification of the first leader of the hunt would eventually come. From Wothu to Wothanes, and so to Wod to Woden. As I mentioned earlier, one must remember that Odin is a magical sorcerer in the books of the Eddas. This was not his original role, and this may not have been considered by some of those arguing against Grimm's position. Odin is a complex character evolving from several different causes, but in his earliest form of Othor, and that is his uh, Germanic equivalent of Wothanaz, he was a death demon, a psychopomp, mad. He moved with a frenzy similar to the Roman god Mercury in some ways, with his ravens, a traveller with messages, but was not necessarily personified. Here we can now connect the key attributes of the leader with good etymological evidence. And if you want to understand this in more detail, I'll talk about more about that in the Woden and the Wild Hunt video. Um, but now I will also point out that I'm not going to use also the argument to link Odin with storms and a storm god to uh, align him to the winds in the Wild Hunt. And in fact, I show evidence in that Odin and the Wild Hunt video that that is not his his purpose or why he was created. He is a mad, crazy, frenzied uh, person, but he is not associated with the wind or storms. He just affects the atmosphere around you locally if he was leading the hunt. But he's not responsible for the weather at all. Um, and so by removing this, we move one of the weaker arguments for Odin leading the hunt. But piecing all the evidence we do have together, we show that we are still missing mythology, or at least tangible traces of the evolution of the wild hunt from our proto-Indo-European ancestors. And we have these tales told today, some of which uh, Wod, Wode, Woden or Odin have uh, as, as the lead, but there are tales that are different, evolving over a thousand years of Christian influence. And the earlier tales are gone, only leaving the name of the leader of the hunt behind, a name that influenced Woden and Odin, and possibly some connection to the animals that could have also led the hunt. And also with this, we lose the origin of the tale of fertility that is also linked with the wild hunt phenomenon. And this is something we must also consider with the tales of the Eddas too, for example. So the poetic Edda and the prose Edda, written after the belief of the gods tried to be erased from the Nordic peoples, and then written again. And especially uh, alongside Snorri Sturluson's prose editor that he hemorrhizes Odin and gives him that altogether more personified sorcerer character. And therefore, we must suffer caution when trying to understand these myths. Through the name of Wothu, along with its evolution, we can see the wild hunt was believed at the time of the Proto-Indo-Europeans. In fact, the name and understanding of the religious belief suggests it was known before the Proto-Indo-European pantheon existed, and that helps explain its spread and explain the maybe not so coincidental overlapping with the Proto-Indo-European centum division language split and the migration into Europe to align with the understanding of the original leader of the hunt that was not personified but a group of frenzied spirits who probably weren't human. But the original stories we now have to accept as being lost, you know, with what remains being no better than a collection of somewhat shuffled and scuffed myths and motifs, topped with a large helping of evolution, Christian influence, uh, and which evolved as the gods and kings came in and out of favour, changing the leader. And with so many variations, a confident reconstruction of a source myth 
will be all but impossible and so of, of limited value. But to me, to suggest as Hutton and Lakoto do that Odin wasn't the original leader of the hunt is not to look at the whole picture. Odin's ancestors were leaders of the hunt. They were psychopomps leading a procession of the dead. And this story shows hints of being built around the story of the dead travelling at night in winter. And the winter solstice was almost certainly one of the most sacred nights of the year for our ancestors. You know, before burial mounds and kurgans and tombs and the like, perhaps this was a way of acknowledging the dead, what some have called a cult of the dead. But we will almost certainly never know for sure. And so for now, all we can feel reasonably assured of is that the only remains of the wild hunt story from a time over several thousand years ago, the story of a psychopomp leading the dead somewhere, whether animal or human, is the ancient name of its leaders, the Wothu. These were originally a group of supernatural spirits and which would eventually evolve into the god the Germanic tribes would name as the derivatives of Wothen, who would become Othor, a cognate of Wothu, and then the old Norse god, Odin. But the story of the Wild Hunt doesn't end there, not quite. As before the time of the Proto-Indo-Europeans, our ancestors were hunter-gatherers, and hunting was an important and necessary part of life. It was critical to our survival, and this is why these stories survive. And so stories of hunting would have been part of our ancestors' culture. These pre-Proto-Indo-European times were almost certainly when the story of the wild hunt started. But when exactly? At the last ice age, maybe earlier? How could we ever find out? Well, what if I told you that we do know of a story that was told back then? All those tens of thousands of years ago. And that story we know today is the cosmic hunt. And so I'll end now with the assessment of a hugely broad and complex topic which I've really only just scratched the surface of. Uh, and to me, it is a lack of understanding of all the evidence that is available in all its context, and with specific notes to Lieberman and his thoughts on the origin of Odin, which has led to certain conclusions to be made by other academics not in support of Grimm. Although also bear in mind that I'm not saying Grimm was right for the right reasons either. And with that, I want to say I really hope you enjoyed that journey through the Wild Hunt's origin and its leader. Please like and share and comment about the video if you did. Let me know if any questions, any challenges, any stories you'd like to know more about. And remember to subscribe to Crick and Forward and hit the notification bell if you want to see more videos like this when they come out. And so, until the next video, please stay safe and stay well. And this was Crack and Forward.